Okay, let's get things started. Uh, my name is Jasper Lawler, Mark Analyst here. I'm taking over from Michael Hewson, who typically does these these webinars. Just looking at what's coming up for the week. Now, uh, let's have. Uh, we've just got this risk warning. I'm sure you've all read it by now. Um, let's bring it through to the next page. Okay. Right, something I was just having a little look at now. But what I'm going to uh, what I'm going to do here is um, look at um, just a few key economic data releases coming up for the week, and then um, and then dig into some charts. And if you could now, or at any point during the presentation when you feel like it, uh, send me a little message as to which you know, which, which products you're exactly interested in, uh, you know, what you've got your eye on at the moment, or just what you always trade, uh, be it Euro, DAX, Dolly Yen, whatever it is you're looking at. Send me a quick note and I'll make sure to cover it. So, I just made this note in our, um, in our insights column. And obviously there's a lot more data than this that's coming out for the week. Um, but this, I think, is the kind of key market driving data, depending on which market you're trading, obviously, that you, you want to keep an eye on. Now, we've already had the, the German industrial production. That was, that was actually better than expected for today. And um, not really helping, uh, helping the DAX. You know, that's still down half a percent. Um, but um, given, the, given the euro a little bit, um, really in terms of the stock indices, you know, they're just following through from, from last week when we had that non-farm payrolls miss. Um, what, you, what you'll see about that report is that the market did initially react quite well to the report because it wasn't really a bad report. Um, in, if, in case you've read the, um, the morning note on the, the US Open or the, the UK Open today, um, the previous two months were revised higher and um, it really, literally narrowly missed by just a, a few thousand, so generally, and, and very close to 200,000 jobs. It generally is a good, was a good report. Uh, my personal take on it is that the S&P pushed up towards 1,900, and people just um, just took profits going into the weekend because of that slight miss and you know better safe than sorry kind of policies, and more of a sort of rebound from that that round number after a, a week of gains. You know, it's got to correct at some point, and people use that rally after that report. Um, to, as a chance to, to sell it off. So keep that in mind. You know, there's not been any kind of seismic shift in in uh, U.S. economic data. Um, it's it's really um, you know as as expected. And the, and the timeline for for tapering the, uh, the the U.S. asset purchases by the Fed really should be you know as expected as you know as previously thought before the report because. Jan you know, the cause of this rally in stocks throughout the week was basically Janet Yellen sort of um, backtracking on her statement that she'd made previously um, about six months being a possible timeline as to when they would raise interest rates after stopping tapering and just really saying that um, you know, it's all data dependent and the Fed is going to remain incredibly accommodative uh, for the foreseeable future. and. Yeah, it's all sort of data dependent. You know, if you see a slight drop in the data, you know they may they may pause tapering and may even add to the stimulus again. So um, that's still the case, and the U.S. Uh, US economy is still sort of steadily improving. Uh, we're just kind of basically wading our way through this first quarter and sort of putting a line under all the first quarter's data, and then you know this month going forward it really is when you'd expect a. The jobs have already kind of held pretty strong, but you want to see some of the other data from the U.S. improving as well. So, like I said, I think more of a sort of technical correction right now. Um, we'll look at the chart for the S&P a little bit in a second, but to me, um, we're at 1857. 1850 is definitely going to be key because that's really been a pivotal price. It may dip a bit below that, but really if it substantially closes below that, we're probably looking at a slightly deeper correction, which may not be such a bad thing. Because if we, again, when we look at the price action, it's, it's been upwards, but kind of grinding upwards and a bit sideways. And to improve the momentum a bit, we may need, need a, a sharper correction to entice some buyers in at, at lower prices. Back to this, um, this uh, insights things that I pulled up. Uh, tomorrow, we've got the Bank of Japan monetary policy statement. 
this is just extra interesting because um, this month Japan introduced their um, their increase in taxes, um, and so uh, the expectation is that that's going to slow down economic growth in Japan, and that um, eventually the Bank of Japan are going to step in and um, ease policy further. They're already engaged in QE, but that's pretty much priced in at the moment in the in the, the yen crosses and the Nikkei. So really, people are waiting for more QE um, to spur the dollar to go higher against the yen and and the, and the Nikkei stock index to, to go higher. But um, general consensus is that's not going to happen at this meeting, um, just because the the central bank doesn't really have the data yet to sort of prove that the sales of sales taxes has dampened the growth. Um, it, some of the economic indicators out of Japan already have started falling off a little bit, so it most likely is going to. Um, the big surprise would be if they did sort of decide to act preemptively ahead of any worsening data and um, your seriously worse data and, and start easing now. But it, it does seem most likely unlikely. But as I've mentioned in the note here, um, the Nikkei and the dollar yen, the other yen crosses would um, most likely fly higher if, um, if, they, did if they did announce some, some further easing. Um, later tomorrow, you've got the UK industrial production. You know, the UK economy is um, recovering, obviously, and, you know, hence the, the strength of the pound and the, the FTSE has been generally outperforming most of the indices by the US. Um, one of the things that's been lacking a bit um, is sort of investment growth. It's been a bit of a sort of consumption-led um, recovery. So any improvements in these areas is definitely looked, looked on favorably and, you know, would be positive when you're trading FTSE and UK shares. Wednesday, um, we've got the trade balance. Again, one of the things that's been missing from the UK recovery so far is um, the growth in exports. The pound has rallied recently, as we all know, but generally speaking, from prior to the, uh, the financial growth, prior to the recession, it's still a lot weaker. And so that should be feeding through to some better exports, but it hasn't really done so. So it doesn't speak to the sort of, you know, growth in kind of quality of UK manufacturing and produce that you know you would hope for as the recovery is investing and improving um, after the you know after the the recession. So any uptick there again is definitely looked on widely. Uh, yeah, I mean the trade balance as a whole is it you know you really want to look deeper within the data more to the exports um, to to take the positives away from that one yeah, the more meaningful data. Um, then later on uh, Wednesday, we've got the, the Fed minutes, and um, uh, that will just be interesting because obviously there has been a bit of, sort of back and forth. Um, you know, Janet Yellen at one point was sounding quite hawkish, saying that six months after the uh, after the end of tapering, we'd see rate raises. Then a few um, Fed officials came out in support of that. Um, Bullard even said that that's in line with private surveys. Um, but then, you know, this statement last week, which caused this rally, which I was just talking about before, um, was really ultra dovish. Um, the the the, um, the meeting that she had, um, the speech that she gave, rather. And so this will just be interesting to see how her sort of ultra dovish speech lines up with these other Fed members um, to give us a bit more of an idea as to uh, when they're going to, you know, when they're going to stop the tapering, firstly, um, if they do. And then... Um, you know, when they're going to raise rates afterwards. Um, and obviously, you know, I'm sure you, you all understand this, but for the general, the general idea being that um, low, low interest rates obviously spur on investment and they make bonds relatively unattractive and so they, they generally keep stocks higher. You know, so the closer we get to, to raising interest rates, then um, that's just, that's, that's generally speaking, bad for stocks. The reason the markets are still kind of generally trending high at the moment is because the positive U.S. growth is sort of outweighing uh, the negative impact of raising interest rates. Um, so that's why you're kind of balancing the two. Is you know you want better better growth, um, GDP growth, and you want you know higher higher employment. All these kind of positive numbers to outweigh the fact that um, you know they are going to be raising interest rates. So obviously when the economy is improving, obviously that that overshadows higher interest rates because it's improving. It's the higher interest rates are kind of like the causation of the 
the economy that the cause might cause the economy to start lagging off. So it's kind of cause and effect indicators. At some point in time, the, the high interest rates are going to cause the economy to, to slow down. But um, you know, it's kind of lagged effect, and the stocks should still should stay high a bit after the raise of rates. Um, you know, based on sort of historically, you know, typically the way it works. Uh, Thursday's big if you trade the Aussie dollar or um, or um, you know the Aussie the Aussie index. Um, basically, the Aussie you may have seen a report I did on an inverse head and shoulders of the Aussie dollar. That the, the kind of cause of the breakout there was some positive numbers from last month. And so if you see some some good numbers again again today, kind of you know beating expectations well or you know, it depends if they're going to be in line with expectations probably not a massive move but you know a good beat you know should help the the RBA the Reserve Bank of Australia stay so sort of fairly neutral in their statements and not jawbone jaw, uh, jawbone the the Australian dollar dollar down too much and so um that would generally be you know, positive for the Aussie and you know generally uh, well, again we can have a look at the charts um, but the inverse head and shoulders I pointed out it's not reached its measured objective yet that you would typically see from that pattern so um, you know this may be the impetus to take it, the Aussie above 93 and then push it closer to that that chart objective um, China, there's a lot of China data this month. Um, the one that I've kind of highlighted particularly here is the trade balance, because you may remember about a month ago, it was this um, Chinese trade balance that came in way below expectations and caused a kind of general slump in global markets. So if we, you know, we may get a, uh, a repeat performance if this uh, on Thursday Chinese data comes in um, worse than expected. Um, obviously, it's not going to be such a shock as it was last time. Um, so probably not going to be the massive sell-off that's seen, but yeah, nevertheless, it's not going to be taken too well. The one thing I just noted in this in, the, in this insight note here is that expectations are a lot lower this time. Um, they're basically looking for, for minus 0.9 billion. Um, so you know, sort of trade deficit of 0.9 billion. So uh, essentially flat. So any essentially any um, you know exports being bigger than imports in any way. Um, generally should be sort of seen as as positive and maybe that will undo some of this sell-off that we've seen in the stock markets recently. French and industrial data, uh, French and Italian industrial data, you know, the periphery of Europe is still a bit weak, so we just need to see improvements here to have any kind of faith that this rally in the euro and uh, and the DAX is, is really deserved because it's really, throughout this whole recession, it's just been Germany holding it up. And we have seen some slight signs of improvement. Um, Spain actually have 10-year high revenues in, um, you know, in um, uh, tourism, so that's you know, that's symptomatic of things. Things are improving there, but um, still a bit sluggish in general. And then Friday we've got the um, Chinese CPI and PPI, and this is a bit of a kind of double-edged sword kind of situation where China are trying to reduce inflation, um, from particularly in the housing market. But then again, any kind of drop in inflation is sort of symptomatic of a sort of slowdown that's happening there. So it's, it's interesting to watch, but it's hard to read exactly what what the market would view, view as and more positive. Um, you know, I'd probably lean towards you know them wanting to see higher inflation to just show that kind of the growth is better than people thought. That's that's short term. Obviously, what you want to see longer term, they really do need to be curbing inflation because there's going to be a housing market crash. If, you know, if they don't do that. Then uh, finally, last but not least, on Friday, we've got the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment uh, for the U.S., and consumer sentiment's been generally pretty strong throughout this whole turndown in the U.S., and so we, we just want to see that continuing because we did see a bit of a slight miss on Friday, even though I said it's generally a pretty positive report, but we did see a slight miss there. So if we saw some misses happening in consumer sentiment as well, that would be taking a couple of the main pillars that people have been riding off this um, this U.S. recovery. Okay, let me close that down now. Um, did any of you um, send me a message uh, about just, you know, just um, which which chart you'd you'd want me to go over more than others? Um, it's fine if you don't. Um, yeah, I've got some defaults I'd look at, but you know, I'm sure you'll trade specific markets. If, if you want me to cover those, of course I'm happy to. Um, I thought I might actually just go straight to currencies. This time, often I start with indices, but I thought there was a few interesting things going on with currencies. <clears throat> right. Um, let's start with the 
euro. Now, what I tend to do in general when it comes to charts is to kind of top-down approach. I, I mean, you look at the monthly first, strictly speaking, but you only have to do that so often. Really start with the weekly and work your way down. So this is quite an interesting potential pattern that's setting up here in the euro. It would be a sort of bearish wedge, um, whereby this was the kind of crash down that you know we all remember during the European um, crisis, and this has been the sort of subsequent recovery. Um, so I've kind of got my timelines a little bit out of whack there, but I think you know what I mean. This is the um, this has been a big downturn in the, the price of the euro. This is what could potentially be a big rising wedge pattern, which um, for the most part, would mean a big breakout down this, in this kind of direction. Certainly far from guaranteed from happening. What I suspect might happen is that we've got this first line, which has been holding up. Yeah, there was a break there, but it's been holding up pretty well since. And we're right at it again. What I suspect is maybe this will break this time. Maybe a little pop higher again, then a break, and then come in right where there's 200-day moving, 200 moving averages. Um, for now, you've just got to assume that the trend is higher, and so you don't really trade off this idea exactly. I mean, you can put some resting orders down here, but you know, there's really no point until the market gets closer. But that's what I'm kind of suspecting might happen. Um, so that's kind of the bigger picture. Then we drop down to the one-day chart. And so this is where we currently are. You know, we've had this kind of move down. And as far as I can kind of see, um, the the move, you know, the kind of correction that we're seeing off this trend line area, uh, sorry, the, the little bounce we're seeing is off this, firstly off this trend line, but then also um, dating back to, you know, the weekends. Generally what you see is when you're kind of trying to tie markets and imagine where they're going to, where they're going to bounce is that you see a sort of resistance turn to support, support turn to resistance. So, you know, this was resistance, broke through, came down and used it as support a few times. I mean, nothing's perfect. As long as it stays above here, it's still an uptrend. But generally, that's what was acting as support. Um, so this is our buy zone. But this is the most kind of aggressive buy, which is right above this high. Made up, made up highs. Um, didn't hold up this time. And you can see these lows were the spur for this to come down here. And then um, you can see here, um, which caused this big momentum move higher in this area is what kind of caused a little bounce there. But that hasn't really done enough to push it up to the highs, and now we're back, now we're through that, and now we're back down to this high again. And then, you know, below that, I'm kind of looking at this high here as a sort of, that was the resistance, and then it becomes the support, right? And that's what caused the price. So then, if we get down again, that's what I'd be expecting to see, that as the next potential support. And again, it doesn't mean it has to perfectly stop here. You know, there it did. There it didn't. Here, on the on the other way around, um, yeah, there it did. It's perfectly kind of stopped there at this high. But again, it depends how you look at it. Nothing's perfect. Again, it could have stopped there, right? Which, you know, arguably that's a close there. In a way, it did respect that as well. So it depends on whether you're using the um, the highs and lows or, or the close as the kind of beginning of this support turns to resistance type area. And always keep in mind it's never going to perfectly. We're going to put your stop loss two pips below this or something just because really as long as it hold in this example, when we're looking at this dip, as long as it held above that low, it's still, it's still an uptrend. So even at this point, it it come down, made a high, you know, lower high. So we're kind of in downtrend territory down, and we, and we still are, strictly speaking. So then when it came down to here, yeah, it did bounce off this low, but it's like it was already trending lower at this point. So it's not like that was the first bounce down. It bounced, made a higher, uh, a lower high, then a lower low before it got there. So you have to weigh up all these different factors. As I see at the moment, yes, it's made a lower low, but have a look just at, this was the low right here from this, um, uh, from this, you know, this reversal pattern here. And it's only just kind of dip below it. It really kind of barely has. And um, and this is a hammer, you know, that's a hammer that caused the bounce. This is another hammer, and quite often you'll see these hammers cause a reaction higher in the interim. So given this is this trend line that we refer to on the longer term trend, and it's this previous resistance turns of support, good chance of a 
this well, it already has bounced obviously but a good chance of it moving up into what now this would be the kind of beginning of the um the kind of momentum change area where it's broken down through there and there would be the next kind of expected area for it to you know if it was going to continue downtrend it would probably be from from here up to there break above there obviously it's a game changer it means we made a higher high and we're back into kind of uptrend territory i wouldn't necessarily buy on the break but that you can but obviously the risk the problem of it is that um you've got all this down here as your risk so more likely what would happen is you'd get a break above there and then a dip down towards here somewhere and then that would be your chance to buy in a, if you believe this this little short term dip has ended now probably go a little bit lower even i tend, tend to stop around the four hour mark um but um this can add a bit more clarity to things you can see it's that was the low and it's really just kind of not really held too well below there and, and it's just shifting above this one hour um twenty one day MMA, uh moving average. So that's a little that's a little sea change there. That's the two hundred hour right there. And then you could draw some kind of trend line down there perhaps and that would be a little kind of indication of a short term change in trend. So at the moment what my kind of takeaway here is that it is a downtrend in the interim. But we've just come off some quite significant support, as I see it, this trend line, combined with this kind of um, resistance turn support area. So it could be the beginnings of a, of a move back up to test 139, 140. Now let's have a little look at the dollar yen. Now this, I think, is one of the more interesting setups at the moment. <coughs> um, Okay, let's again let's go start with the weekly. Now I'm sure most of you, if you trade the yen, have this trend line on here. Fairly obvious stuff. But that is what's supporting the price and that's what's keeping us bullish at the moment. Um, the other factor is this trend line here, which as of last week has pretty much been um been held. It spiked higher, and this is a um, you know, this is a big shooting star reversal pattern here. Um, so you know that's kind of um, that's kind of a bearish pattern. And what you'll notice is that we actually have a pretty identical looking pattern on the the Dow, and the dollar yen and the Dow are kind of pretty well correlated at the moment. They don't look perfectly the same, but they're both displaying kind of similar similar patterns. Um, now price is above this trend line at the moment, so various things to consider. <clears throat> the reason I've got this line in here again is I was considering this to be the support to the price based on this weekly chart, and you can see that that was the first one there, and it kind of held there. There's a big spike lower than it held, and then that was the big drop off that we saw. Um, I think that was most likely when we started hearing about Ukraine. Or maybe that was that Chinese trade. I don't remember. <clears throat> it was uh, early in the year. It might have been prior to all that. So then, um, <clears throat> so then, yeah. As you can see, prices kind of come off that with this evening star pattern. So, generally speaking, this is a pretty bearish pattern, and it takes a brave soul to trade against that. Um, but you have to consider all the different factors. Let's drop down to the daily chart. Now, this is the reason you might want to trade against it. Is that look at this trend line. Yeah, you'll agree that's 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 pretty perfect, right? It stopped right there on this line. You know, and what you could potentially see is is a move up to test 104 and above again, if this triangle pattern has essentially worked. You know, that's a long-term triangle um, base, but you could arguably have a short-term one here. It doesn't fit well very well, and I haven't put it in. But if you assume that was the top of the triangle, then you'd be looking for a projection of something like 100 to 104.50, you know, you'd add that on top of here. So that's 450 pips. You're looking about, you'd be looking about sort of 108.50 as potential price target if this did prove to be the low. And right now, it's not proving too supportive on the RSI because the RSI has actually moved below this equivalent triangle pattern. But again, it's it's nothing's perfect, and it may well prove to to bounce up towards the 70 overbought level and 
and up into 80 again. At the moment, RSI is confirming the price moves and there's not, sh not showing any particular divergence on this um, daily chart. They're down to the four hours. Um, it's an inside bar a moment on, on the, uh, the four hours, so nothing too obvious. Although we are seeing a potential um, reversal here at the over at the old sold level around 30 on the RSI on the four hourly. So you're probably looking for something a bit more positive above these levels to be able to feeling a bit more confident about this proving to be a low. Probably what's likely to happen is something where it kind of comes up a bit, then down again pretty close to these lows to form some kind of reversal in this kind of interim. Maybe it's going to chop around a bit first before breaking. Maybe it won't break. Okay. If you could send me, a, I don't know if you've sent a message to the group, anyone, uh, but if you if you could just send me perhaps a private message, if you had some particular market you wanted me to cover, because I feel like I'm missing some messages here. Good stuff. Um, okay, over to the Dow. That's what I had on my chart when we first, when we first had a look here. And um, again, it's a similar pattern to the dollar yen, and arguably worse, just because these these were the highs set uh, at the end of last year, and these, what we did break intraday, um, but um, it's been a big shooting star reversal last week, similar looking to the, the dollar yen, just because we did, we fell sort of um, three digits in the Dow on, on Friday, and it's um, now it's starting to look a bit ominous, and you can see it's a similar looking sort of triangle set up, right, but we're just closer to the highs, it's pushed above the highs run a bunch of people stop losses perhaps and then just crashed on down here so again this is a pretty big bearish pattern but we've got to keep in mind that we are still in the context of an uptrend that's still a marginally higher high these are higher lows we're above the moving averages so if we are being bearish it needs to be fairly short term for the time being before we get some wider confirmation now there's a big um on fr friday we saw a big engulfing candlestick pattern, so obviously that's a, another bearish pattern um, on the shorter time frame. And at the moment, this um, sort of equivalent triangle pattern held up on Friday, but it's looking like it might not hold up now. Next level would be um, here, that I'd have in mind. Because that's where we saw some momentum break higher. But then down below this, we're not really in uptrend territory anymore. And then you need to, you know, that's when you need to reassess whether you should be still buying in the short term. Um, above that, we're still good for buying as long as we don't sort of form a, a lower high in the, in the meantime. Um, you know, if we just drop straight down to this level, I'd expect to see some buying because we're still higher highs. Even though it did collapse at this longer term level, you'd doesn't necessarily mean it's going to jump straight back up there, but get at least see some buying interest starting around here, I would suspect. Below that, we're down to this um, this level that relates to this high, and it also, you know, you can see it's kind of acted as a key pivotal level here, and it's there that caused that big impetus. It was the resistance there, broke through, came back as as um, support, and it's been holding since. So that you know, that's a big one. This uh, 16140 really. Okay, uh, yep, thanks. Thanks, Peter. Got your message about the Aussie. Um, I'll have a look at that. I'm, you know, just because I really like that um, that pattern, the uh, reverse head and shoulders, I'm kind of clinging on to that at the moment. Um, it, the Aussie's taken a knock just because it's really a continuation of 
this RBA statement that we saw um, last week, whereby um, uh, you know Governor Stevens did still explicitly talk about the, the Aussie dollar. I forget the exact wording, but it was something along the lines of the weaker dollar, the weaker Aussie is still supporting the economy, but the slight rise that we've seen recently um, is starting to impact that, something like that. So it's it's almost saying that we're okay for now, but we don't like this higher Aussie. So it depends how you want to read that. I'm kind of hoping to read it as the we're okay for now aspect of that, um, that will justify a projection from this pattern pointing us higher in the Aussie. So this neckline is not exactly perfect, and you know, have to be a bit careful with these projections. You could, it could maybe be a slanted one down there, um, something more like <clears throat> that. It's like more of a, a consideration I looked at as well, which that one doesn't fit very well, but then it's sort of there, could potentially make, makes it look a bit nice. So up to you, you have to be, you know, this is kind of generalizations, these projections, but still theoretically, if we call the low 87, we call the high of the pattern 90, that's 300. So we've made it, um, hold on, no, what am I saying? 87 to 91, sorry, so that's 400. Um, so we've made it to 250, which is 300 perhaps so far. So in theory, it would be a bit further to go, I think maybe up towards this 94.50. The, um, in terms of the daily pattern, it was a bullish engulfing thereabouts, the bodies at least, last uh, on Friday. And so this is just a correction from this range. And I don't know if it's going to stay in this range for until the Aussie unemployment data um, later in the week. It might do. Maybe that would be the cause of the break above 93. But I'm not too concerned about this. Um, it looks more corrective to me at the moment than it does a sort of big reversal. Now this is more like a kind of, at the moment, that's like a big strong move. This is like a bull flag. And then you'd get the equivalent move out of the top. That's not to say it can't dip down to one of these levels. Um, I think I had a more specific, yeah, I had this, this chart. So this is kind of how I got it laid out more specifically. So, you know, that's a big strong move higher, right? But these are kind of trickling moves low. In terms of momentum, you'd still sort of think that perhaps it's it's to the upside. That said, I was actually sort of, I had this line in, but I was sort of surprised it held. I was actually expecting maybe a drop down to 50 after those RBA uh, talks last week. Um, okay. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to end the official webcast because um, I think I've covered most of the main points. But then uh, what I'll do is I'll continue um, unrecorded and answer some of, you, some of you guys' questions. So I hope that was useful for anyone who has to dash off now after the after 30 minutes. But as I said, I will be continuing um, just uh, answering you guys' question uh, unrecorded. Thanks a lot for attending. Uh, it's the CMC Markets uh, weekly update. And uh, my name is Jasper Lawler, signing off now. But as I said, we'll be continuing. Cheers.